you know, some of the people, a type one team came in and I'd been out with that team several times and they kept, you know, checking to see how I was doing. And, and I said, you know, I'm doing okay. Uh, they're professional firefighters, just like I used to be. They know the risks. Uh, and for me, emotionally, uh, being the first type one team to go into Katrina at the airport was a lot more, was a lot harder for me. Well, what was it? So, Katrina, what year was Katrina? It was like 97? No, 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 it was 2000 and I think it was 2005. So how how did how did you end up down there? <laughs> this is a pretty weird story. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, it's the same way, you know. I'm on the available list nationally, and all the Type One PIOs in the South, either you know, I mean, they couldn't go. I mean, they were. I mean, they just needed to take care of their own families, or else they lost their homes. I mean, it was that kind of deal. And so dispatch called me and says, hey, you know, go to Katrina. He says, report to the airport. He says, how am I supposed to get there? He says, there were no flights. Drive. And so I drove from Albuquerque to New Orleans. And, uh, and it's like I didn't have, I had a security clearance document and I had my red card and, you know, and no one stopped me. I mean, I didn't even get stopped. It was amazing. But there was so much an or, or organized chaos, maybe, that, you know, and I remember going down, oh, I misspelled it, or misstated, Pont Karen Lake, or whatever it was, and there were abandoned cars everywhere, there were alligators, dead alligators, I mean, it was just, and when I got to the airport, it so happened, I mean, I didn't know where to go, I didn't know where the team was, and uh, I happened to know the number two guy at FEMA, that was, not FEMA, with the, uh, the airport security, uh, TSI. And uh, he told me where the team was. I ran into him. And, uh, you know, that was just, it was one of me, and our job was logistics, because we took care of the military, the, the National Guard, all the various medical teams, you know, with food and showers and, you know, that sort of thing. And then we had a couple of CC crews who were uh, uh, running the sticks for the helicopters whenever they were coming. CC is what? What kind of crew? Conservation Corps. Okay. And uh, I mean it was just, it was different. So what 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 happened to, uh, under that incident that you were involved in that left such a big impression on you? Well, you know, you'd, school buses would drive up, there were 10, 20 helicopters flying at any one time, people getting off of the black bag garbage sack with all their possessions, not knowing where they were going to end up. There were planes coming and going. I mean, it was just... So you were transferring people out of the area on yeah. planes? Yeah. It, what, so that was like an incident command team that was part of a bigger set of teams? Is that how that uh, worked? It wasn't It should have been, <laughs> but it wasn't. We ended up, the team I was with was the red team, uh, southern red team. They ended up uh, being the ones that did plans, had the morning meetings, the evening meetings. I mean, because the it, other it entities the, were didn't understand the incident command system, and they didn't know how to organize. So that well, you know, there was ways that things were going to get done in an organized fashion. So it became the incident command team. Well, yeah, I don't think they ever called us that. Yeah, because we were just there for logistics. But you know, a team did a good job. How long were you there? I don't know if I was there the whole two weeks or it was close to the two week period. And then I drove home. And then I went back down. They called me to go out in the area command team in Mississippi. I'd been home maybe a week. I'd uh, never been on an area command team, but basically that was going around to all the other teams. By then we had 10 or so teams down there, type twos, type ones, just checking in on them to see how they're doing, do they need stuff. And, and the thing that was amazing to me was there were people that didn't want to go home after two weeks. They were doing humanitarian work, you know. And, uh, and they just didn't want to go home. Some of them, I mean, they, had, they couldn't keep doing it. They had to go home for a while. So part of my job is to evaluate some of the information people to see, hey, you know, it's time for you to go home. You've been here three weeks. You need to go 
go see the kids and your husband. And well, what was your take on the how the how the military joint operations teams melded with the incident command teams? I mean, what was going on there? I mean, what what really needed to be done, or what didn't work? What worked? Uh, well, you the military won't like this, but. Uh, I can't remember if it was the 101st or the 82nd. They were supposed to be going to Afghanistan or Iraq, I don't remember which. And they showed up. And they were supposed to be self-contained. Well, they weren't. <laughs> they still had logistical needs. And, uh, and for a while they tried to start running their own meetings. And then finally, I think eventually they did. But that was after most of the people were evacuated and gone. The hardest part, I mean, we had a morgue there too. We didn't talk about it because we had a whole bunch of medical people from all around the country. And uh, uh, the time I teared up was they wouldn't let people get on the helicopter uh, until with pets. And then finally they let people come on with their pets. And when you just saw people that were staying in flooded areas just because of their pets, I mean, it. And that's something I've noticed in a lot of fires. There's so many people that don't want to leave when they should leave, and it's all because of their horses or their cat yeah. that ran away. I mean, it's just, yeah. they, you know, you realize the significance the pets have for a lot of human beings. Well, you, you've, you've been able to follow that whole incident command system development from when it was used on the fire firefighting out west yeah. till, till Katrina, which before Sandy probably was the biggest deal ever. Yeah, and uh, the only people that understood the incident command system uh, are the Coast Guard. They got it, but they weren't directly working with us. And what and about the what about the guard, the uh, the state guard units? Did they uh, understand it at all? I don't you know. Couldn't say. Huh? It was uh, the ironic thing of it is, uh, you know, I knew this number two guy, and so he took me back to the room because these people were checking in. They had limited TSI stuff, and that room. It was half the size of this office, just loaded with machine guns, pistols, knives, all kinds of weapons. Because, you know, people were fearful, and, uh, but there were no incidents. So, in other words, the weapons were, people had to leave them there? In well, yeah, they wouldn't let them get on an airplane oh, with oh, a I see. submachine gun. <laughs> <laughs> and the TSI people were flying in and out just to do the inspections, because there was no place for them to stay. Yeah. But back on the development evolution incident command system, I mean, it was something that firefighters used back in the late 60s, probably? No. No. The incident command system started in California, like a lot of things did, as I recall. Because we had, the Forest Service used what was called the Large Fire Organization. And it would have been in about, oh, probably not until the late 70s. I mean, you could research that, it'd be easy to find out that it was adopted by the other federal agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, Park Service, and Forest Service. And then, uh, and that would, and then it would, and it was basically those federal organizations using it. I know a lot of the states, the sheriffs, the firefighters at the state level, they started getting involved. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it kind of hit the wall when it could, try to mix uh, to, to meld with the military then is that basically where it's at now or? you know I have not been other than maybe three or so fires incidents where there were military involved I mean I just didn't have a lot of experience with the military much more with the National Guard yeah okay well uh, so now you know, do you plan to stay involved in the incident command well it's like I, it's like I told Alicia my wife I said you know I've been on hundreds of fires, and I'd really like for a Yarnell Hill fire not to be my last fire. So I'll that for an answer. Yeah. I even joked with her the other day when I was telling her about you, I said, you know, maybe they'd take me back to being a smoke trooper. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little two-manner up in the Bob Marshall. <laughs> yeah, that's a good life. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no, nah, I mean, it, you know, it was a good career for me. I enjoyed it. I had, you know, I'd been legislative affairs coordinator for so long that started to get a little dull. You know, I mean, the same piece of legislation, five congresses in a row, and, you know, doing the hearing prep and the Q's and A. I mean, all that stuff. I just, 
dig out the computer and see what you said last time, and change a few dates. And, but I think staying involved in the incident command part of it, being a type one information officer, that was good for me. I mean, it got me out of the office. And, you know, you things weren't nebulous. It was clear, you had a clear mission. And it ain't that way uh, in a lot of the other Forest Service lines of work. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, John.